every family is affected one way or another by mental health, and today on Context, we're finding out more on the mind in crisis. Today, Context takes you on the road to look for solutions to a condition that affects one in four mental health challenges. Take a look at this. Top chefs are cooking up a spicy example of why a meaningful job is part of a healthy mind. During one collaborative evening, chefs came together to make a way for people with mental illness to have jobs in the culinary industry. I believe by being involved, it does, it does create a dialogue. Uh, and when you look at one in five people experiencing mental health issues, that means that every single family experiences this. So whether they acknowledge it or not, or, or talk about it, it's something that they relate to. So when there's a program out there that actually exists to deal with it, I think they're there and, and uh, they're happy to be a part of it. For chefs to come out and actually recognize this is a great thing. And we'll, we'll be hiring one of the students at the restaurant this year, uh, as soon as their program is done. Uh, we'll make that choice and figure out who that's going to be and, and uh, happy to play a part in it. It's, uh, life is very simple. When people need help, you have to be there. We wanted to learn more about the augmented education program, so Context went to class at George Brown to learn firsthand the benefits of this unique program. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us on Context. Now, you've completed the George Brown Augmented Education Program and have graduated, but can you describe what your life was like before that program? Before that program, uh, I was specifically homeless um, in, in Toronto and in London, where I'm from, uh, suffering from both drug and alcohol addiction and mental health, uh, specifically major depression and anxiety. Um, it was living, it looked like me living on the streets, uh, begging for money, asking people for money uh, while I had a job and using all that money on drugs and alcohol. Um, and at that point, my mental health was pretty much gone. I had no supports at that time. I had no um, place to live, no respect for myself. And at that point, my family wasn't able to help me anymore. Um, and I was pretty much uh, disconnected from them every way possible. And, and how I got to a place where I knew that I was done, I couldn't do this anymore, um, was w a point where I was ready to kill myself and I was just done. I couldn't handle it anymore and I just didn't want to be on this earth because I could not handle the pain I was in. Um, and so that, at that point I knew I needed some help and I went back to my parents and uh, they were ready to help me at that point. But you did have a job at that point? Yes. What was it like trying to maintain employment in that state of mind? That day that it happened I was let go from my job uh, because I showed up high and uh, they could only put up with so much. That time me calling in sick, me not showing up, showing up late, and uh, I was let go. And it was a very low stress job. So it only shows that even low stress can just set off anything if you're not, you know, in the right mindset. Ashley knew she needed a change. With the support of CAMH, she enrolled in a culinary program free for students with mental illness. But what she learned extended beyond the classroom. In the program, the life skills, learning how to handle stress, um, talk to employers and disclose certain information about my mental health and addiction, when appropriate. I, I mean, the skills you can adapt any time, but learning the life skills is one of the hardest things. How do you have to change your whole attitude? And that was something that nine months slowly taught me, right? And I had to maintain it outside of work. I saw your eyes light up when you spoke about um, what you do at George Brown. Do you think it's important to have a passion about what you do, to have purpose within your work? Do you think that's important and contributes to mental health? If you don't have something you like to do or really enjoy doing, it's hard to get up in the morning. It's hard to just find a reason to continue on in the day, right? To get out of bed and to, that's the big thing about depression is just getting out of bed, right? To get out of bed and do something and have purpose is w w how I get through my mental health, um, you know? And that was what I had to experience in this program. I had to try all these different things to find out what I really loved doing and wanted, that made me want to get up in the morning. And what do you think Canadians need to better understand about mental health? Um, where have we fallen short? Where do even employers need to better understand people that they've maybe hired who suffer with mental health or addiction? Uh, I think there needs to be a little bit more awareness that, uh, I can't even remember the numbers, but how many people in the workforce actually have mental health and don't talk about it? 
right? And, and it's a two-way street. Um, someone with mental health has to be willing to disclose a little bit of information or have a certain level of boundaries that they know that they need to stand up for when it comes to the workforce, as well as the employer needs to have a little bit of tolerance towards someone with mental health. And uh, I have to be comfortable talking about it in order for other people to be comfortable talking about it. And that's, I think, the only way to get through the stigma is just to talk about what actually happens. What do I feel when I have an anxiety attack? Right? What, ha what happens inside? Right? And if people don't know that because they don't experience it, they're not going to understand it. Right? So there's a, lot, there's a lot of things that need to be done on both parts. But I think it's just the talk about it. You know. Just a light question now. When are you feeling your best? I just had an amazing day the other day. I, I spent it with my nephew. Um, I'm able to watch people trust me with their kids which is really weird because I never thought that would happen in my life because I just was, wasn't stable. I isolated so much in my addiction and mental health that I didn't have a social life. And now I have the ability to have those conversations. You know, yes, I get to work and help people and that's another part of it, but the fact that I can spend time with family and friends is, is just out of this world. And I also have my own private chef catering company that I work for and I also continue to work for George Brown in the ICC department. So there, I'm in the industry, um, and I've stuck in the industry f several times, um, but mine is helping people, and that's what I learned in the program is culinary and helping people with it. It's been a long journey getting into a chef's uniform, and along the way, an unusual encouragement, a message in a t-shirt that originated in a mental health ministry that Sheldon Neal had been exploring. So this shirt is nine years old. Uh, when I got it uh, back in the day. Um, I was working at a, a liquidation store and uh, I was homeless at the time. So I was working and trying to keep appearances and um, I didn't have any clothes to take with me on the streets. So what I did was something that I'm not very proud of, but I stole the shirt from a bin of shirts that they had at this liquidation store. And I didn't know anything about it. It was just green, it had a cool saying on it, I thought. Um, and so I just kind of took it. And at this time, I was suffering with uh, depression and anxiety and some suicidal thoughts, right? I, um, and, and with my addiction. And inside of the shirt is a whole story that explained um, why this guy made these shirts. And it was for a friend to show support and uh, help her with her uh, dis depression and addiction at the time. And show that there are people out there that are willing to help support these people, right, that are struggling with this. And it kind of brought me to a point where I was like, oh my God, this is what's happening to me. Like, this is what I'm going through and what I'm struggling with. So I got clean in 2014 and have remained clean since. And I still have this shirt that now means so much to me because it touched my life and it showed me where I was, and I still keep it to this day to explain to people, like, look, yes, I did something bad to get it, but now I'm doing all the right things That's in my life, yes. It's, um, it's, very, it's, very, it's very cool to explain the story to people, so to have me here today to explain this is awesome, and I'm very grateful. I was researching these t-shirts and learned they were made to support one girl's mental illness struggle. Jamie Twarkowski wrote her story on MySpace, not realizing it would go viral. Today, his foundation, To Write Love on Her Arms, has one of the largest social media followings of any nonprofits. Jamie, let's start here. Um, you suffer from depression and you've been quite vocal about that. Um, and you also cite um, that untreated depression stands as the leading case of suicide. Give us a picture um, of what it is for yourself, um, a day in the life of someone um, such as yourself dealing with, with depression. Yeah, I think. You know, for me, there's definitely been different seasons of it. I use that word season a lot. So it is something that I've struggled with for years, but there's definitely, it has looked different or, or there's been varying degrees along the way. Uh, some examples that I give, I think it can be hard to fall asleep at night, hard to get out of bed in the morning. Maybe you lose your appetite, maybe your appetite changes, maybe the, ap the opposite happens. I know for me, um, one that's been true and, and that's been really hard is uh, my mom asking if I'm okay or saying, you know, I miss your smile or, you know, the people who know us, and, and there's something healthy about this, the people who know us, they know when we're off, they know when we're down, and, and that can be a really powerful thing. You cite statistics that claim two out of three people who suffer from depression don't get help to deal with it. Um, why don't people get the help they need? 
I think the word stigma is the first thing that comes to mind. And, and if you unpack that a little bit, I think it's essentially the lie that we are alone. And when it comes to our pain or our questions, we need to keep that a secret. And I think we're afraid of being labeled, being judged, being misunderstood. And I think that stigma begins to go away just when we begin to talk about it. You know, what we're doing today, I, I think honesty is really contagious. And us being, me being vulnerable about my pain, whether I say it or not, it, it invites someone else to do the same. But how do we deal with pain? Because it's oftentimes that intersecting point that if I suffer loss, disappointment, but I don't handle the pain the right way, I could be immediately looking down a path or going down the gateway leading to guilt, depression, shame, etc. What is the proper way that we can deal with our pain and bounce back in a positive way? I think, I think we need other people. So I think it starts with talking to someone. Maybe a place to start is, is a friend, a family member, someone you trust. And beyond that, professional help. And, and you know, people ask me all the time, how do I know if I should go to counseling? And kind of smile and say, you should you should probably go. And, and maybe you go for a few weeks and you realize you're doing okay, but, but it doesn't hurt to go and to give that a try, especially if you're starting to wonder, hey, I, some things feel off or there's some things I'm, I'm really struggling with or carrying around. Talk to me about your new book, If You Feel Too Much. Uh, why did you feel it was time to put this together and why now? There's been a lot of surprising open doors with the work that I get to do and, and I wanted to try to put that in one place. You know, even in, in chronological order, uh, just as a, as a way to give it a home, a, a proper home, you know, beyond the internet. And, and was so thankful that I was able to do that. Tell us about the movie To Write Love in Her Arms. So I love to tell people the movie is broken people trying to love broken people. It's not like one girl is is struggling and everyone else is okay and someone's the hero, but there's really a sense of everyone has their issues and, and everyone's kind of working those out, but trying to care about each other. And, and that was true to the experience that we really had. You're someone of faith. Um, how does a relationship with God um, help us or help you deal with depression when you're facing it? I grew up in church. Uh, I think it has been a journey. It has. Uh, I think I, I say I don't know more now than when I was a kid. Uh, even specific to depression, my thoughts were very simple and uninformed when I was younger. I just thought if, if someone struggled with depression, you pray and, and God shows up and, and God fixes you because that's what God does. And I'm sure that can happen. God can do whatever He wants. But uh, I can't escape this feeling that I'm loved by a God who desires my honesty and and we talk a lot people Christians the Bible talk a lot about freedom and I think if we're if we're truly free we're invited to be honest um, certainly there's the irony that it's God he he already knows but um, he can handle our pain our anger our questions our doubts and so I think that that's in there and, and I love to tell people and I think I have to tell myself that we don't have to I don't have to fake it and, and so I think that definitely comes to mind. This is a tug of war that is kind of at play now where people say, you know, true faith in God really rests in praying the problem away and uh, not really resting on medication and doctors. That's not true faith. And, you know, some of the staff here may not even know, but, you know, I suffered from, uh, during a portion of my life, went through a whole season of suicide. And I was one of those people who uh, prayed and by God's grace, you know, God lifted it and I've never had to deal with it again. Um, but I'm not, you know, insensitive to the fact that that is not the reality for everyone. That sometimes medication will have to be used. But how do we, how do we marry the two together so they're, they're not on opposites? Um, how do we do that? I think you can pray about anything. You know, you pray about any circumstance, feeling. Uh, we're invited to bring everything to God. but. I, I kind of come back to the broken arm example because no one would, would you know, if, if, if I broke my arm and the bone was sticking out, yeah. no one in this room is going to say, hey, we, we just need to pray for you. Yeah. It's like, hey, no, we, we got to get your yeah. arm fixed. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think mental health should be treated any different. What do you feel it means to be human struggling with depression who has faith in Christ? What does that extra element Christ add to this picture in being human? I think it's the same thing, you know, I think that, you know, we're invited 
to be honest, um, even if someone is not a follower of Christ, I, I hope that and believe that and think that's an excellent place to start, yeah. is the idea that, hey, God can handle your questions, your doubts, your beliefs. I think there's an element of respect in that. Maybe the starting point as a believer would be that you're made to be in relationship with God through Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and then with that, you get to live here and be in relationship with other people as a, as a reflection of that and even as a reminder of that. Up next, actor and movie star Paul Gross on his experiences in Afghanistan and his first-hand observations of PTSD. Paul Gross is a Canadian movie producer whose career has been woven together with the fabric of the Canadian military. But in his latest movie, Hyena Road, he tackles the Canadian mission in Afghanistan and how that military work might be affecting the mental health of our soldiers. You've explored the new veteran like nobody else has in your movie, Hyena Road. What did you learn about the scars of PTSD? Um, I, I should just start out by saying I'm by no means an authority on it. So the, anything I have to say is really just anecdotal. I, I, it, it's, it's something that is there and present all the time. It, it hits people who are not, I mean, it, there isn't, you couldn't look at so there's 10 different people and so, say, well, that person is going to suffer and that person's not. It is really, indiscriminate in, in who it affects. I think to some extent all soldiers experience uh, different degrees of trauma, of course. I was out on foot patrols and stuff and, and fairly exposed and you're really quite aware that you're, and it can, something awful can happen anywhere, at any time. You know, every step you take is potentially the last step you take at, a, at some level. You're very aware of that and, and I've never been so exhausted as going out on a, you know, for <coughs> a four-hour foot patrol through villages and grape fields. Have you any advice for us on this word, mental health? Uh, I don't, I certainly don't have any advice, but I think we're, what I'm encouraged by is that we seem to, by and large now, have agreed that this is something that can come out of the shadows and can be discussed and that it is not shameful to be depressed. It is not shameful to have uh, a mental health issue that needs to be contended with. And I think that that's the, the journey, at least in my lifetime, to, of all of us collectively coming to that position, I think is the most encouraging thing of all, that we're now able to talk about it and people quite freely come forward and talk about it. And, you know, I, I, we had a screening of Hyena Road for Romeo Dallaire, who was part of Wounded Warriors, and he talked to me about it. I mean, he was very affected by it the film and, and it upset him deeply and then we talked for about a, an hour afterwards and he said that he felt that we're good now at talking about physical wounds. We have begun to be able to talk about psychological wounds, operational stress disorders, PTSD. But he said there's another wound that we've, we've got to start to contend with in the military which is uh, moral wounds that the things that we have done that we cannot live with or the things that we have been that we have not done, he felt in his case, that we cannot live with. And, and I think it's, we're just starting to turn the corner on how to look at that. And it's, a, it's quite a big, it really is, if you know the military at all, it's quite a sea change for them to have to contend with it. It took a long time for them to come around to that. And I, but I think it's extraordinarily encouraging that they are. And I, and I think it bodes well for the men and women in uniform in the future. You guys, as a family, live in a very interesting place. How do, you, how do you stay well? Two kids, wife in the business. I suppose for us the important thing is that we have each other and, and that, we're, that, we, that we recognize our good fortune. Uh, it's, it's very easy to, to fall prey, I think, to envy or jealousy or wanting something more and, and be and to forget how much you do have. And part of the reason why I think we like traveling is you're always reminded of what you have. You know? The rest of the world is not as lovely as ours. And, 
And I always find that a great tonic and, and, ground, and grounds us, I think, in our lives. Paul Gross, thank you very much for being with Context. Thank you. Cognitive behavioral therapy has a track record of combating mental illness, but it has been one of the most inaccessible forms of therapy for the general public. Until now, here's how we discovered it coming to a phone app near you. My name is Jeff Perron. I'm a PhD candidate in clinical psychology at the University of Ottawa. I think we're starting to see stigma lift around mental health. Uh, the problem is that even if you recognize, hey, I want to do something about my mental wellness, you still basically have two options, and that's uh, go on medication or uh, see a therapist. TrueReach is based around lessons that, are, that come from cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. And so what users are going to see is a number of CBT-based lessons. These are quick, engaging lessons, all about five minutes or less, that are going to teach you skills to help you deal with thinking patterns and behavior patterns that are related to that depression and anxiety. And so these lessons are going to teach the user skills and how to use what's called a thought journal. So it's, it's kind of like your traditional journaling, but a little more structured. So the thought journal is one of the, the classic CBT tools that helps people change their thinking patterns, and, and that's built into the app. Is this app enough for people to develop and maintain mental health? This is one part of the equation. So just like you know, going to the gym is an important part of our physical health, you still need to watch what you're eating. You know, you still need to, from time to time, get a massage. This is one part of it, and we want to be careful and say, you know, this isn't the be-all and end-all, but for a lot of people, it's going to definitely give you some skills that can help you deal with feelings of depression, anxiety, and stress. Someone who's dealing with, let's say, um, a mental health issue where there's um, what we would call you know hallucinations or psychosis maybe a, a more severe form of schizophrenia it's not for for that person and that person needs to to seek help from the appropriate face-to-face -face therapist and we've been looking at this as an issue with younger adults do you think they are more vulnerable to needing something like CBT and why you know I, I don't know whether young adults are necessarily more vulnerable than uh, you know, older adults or however you want to term it, but young adults, I think, are possibly at a higher risk because the channels aren't as clear. And when something happens in a young person's life, whether that be um, a family member passing away, whether that be an illness, whether that be going to, to university, oftentimes it's a major first time dealing with a big stressor. And so when it's your first time going through something that's really stressful, sometimes you think, how am I ever going to get out of this? And so that's where young people are at higher risk is they need to know that even though it feels like the world is ending, there are things out there that can help them um, in those moments of crisis. And even though it takes time to get a hold of the right resources, whether that's True Reach, whether that's a therapist, know that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel and we know how to help people get better from anxiety and from depression. Well, here at Context, we are always interested in your story or the impact our stories have on you. Do you have an experience with the mental health care system in Canada? Well, give the True Reach app a try and let us know what you think. We want to hear about your joy and your suffering. So why don't you give us a call at the number 1-800-215-4913. Also, reach us by email at comments at contextwithlorna.com or even on Twitter and Facebook at Context TV. You talk, we listen. On the other side of the break, the great call of Jesus into our mental health challenges. That's next. statements of Jesus I love most are the words he spoke in John 10 verse 10. 
I've come to give life in all its fullness. But when mental health is challenged, that hope for a full life becomes a prayer for help. And as we saw today, mental health cannot be a solo pursuit. There is therapy, even done with a phone app. There's a need for prayer, for spiritual care, for employment support. There's a need for volunteerism, a need to break out of isolation. And in the Bible, we see examples of Jesus setting people free from psychological pain. That's an example we're called to share with others. Caregivers are also healers. Sometimes it's by being a friend or by persisting to get the tools and skills needed. If you know anyone or yourself may be struggling with anything about what we've spoken about on today's show, please contact us. Check out our mental health resources featured today on our website at contextwithlornaduick.com for practical guide of how to get help. Together, we can work to see that it can get better for mental health. For all of us at Context, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. Hi, I'm Jeff Gruenwald, president of Media Voice Generation, the charitable organization that produces Context with Lorna Duick. We strive to bring you news and current affairs stories from a Christian perspective. And the French people have given up on the option of the church and the option of God as being relevant in their lives. The critical plight of refugees. More than 3,000 people have been killed uh, on the way to, to Europe uh, only this year. And the controversy around climate change. And we've been operating as a global society on the, on the premise that some people just have to be sacrificed if we want to have this kind of energy. You can find us online with special features and commentary on our website, on our Facebook page, on Twitter and on YouTube. I'm asking you to make a one-time gift or become a monthly supporter. Help ensure that we can continue to bring you more stories that reveal Christ and show God at work in the world. If you believe context is worth every minute, then we need your support.